Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to our Science and Health Career Pathways Information Session. My name is Mary Beulah and I am the director of Erie Together, which is a countywide movement heavily focused on helping more students become successful adults. As part of my role, I facilitate the Erie County Career Pathways Alliance, which is a group of local school districts, employers, universities, and workforce developers, all working together to help students prepare for future careers. Our goal tonight is to help you understand opportunities in the science and health career pathway, which includes agriculture, food and natural resources, health sciences, and scientific research. We want to touch on what students should do to prepare for careers, highlight some of the jobs that exist, and give you the opportunity to learn from our panelists' experience. So we've assembled a great team tonight, and we have a lot of uh, really good information that we're going to be gathering from them. But we want to make sure that you ask whatever questions you have while we have them all together. We've structured tonight pretty tightly. Uh, we're starting with speaker introductions first, and then a presentation on industry insights from Janet Anderson, a local workforce development expert. We will then turn to our panelists with a series of questions we've developed and others that you submit. If you have questions you'd like to pose to any of our panelists, please type them in the chat so we can raise them for you. Please understand that if you're here and you can hear us, your technology is working. Now, because we've had some technology issues this evening, if you're here and you can't hear us, please type something in the chat so we know that. Um, here are some additional things that you should know to help ensure tonight's evening um, session goes well. First of all, panelists, please make sure your camera is turned on and your microphone is muted. And remember to unmute yourself when you're speaking. Students and families, your cameras and microphones have been disabled. So when you want to ask a question, you'll put it in the chat. And finally, we're recording this session so we can provide the video to school districts after the session and they can share it with more students. So here's how the chat works. Uh, the chat feature is in the main bar at the bottom of your screen labeled chat. When you have a question, please click on the chat button and type it in. If you want to direct your question to a particular panelist, please type their name in with your question, but if your question's for anybody, just type the question in and my colleague Jennifer Ponzer from Career Street and I will take it from there. We have an hour set aside for the session tonight, but if we run out of questions before then, we'll wrap up early. If we run out of time though, we'll take your questions and we'll provide them to the panelists and get a response for you after the event. So before we start, let's have everyone try out their chat. Please type in how many parents you have with you tonight, anywhere from zero on up. Okay, thank you. All right, it's time to get started. Panelists, we're gonna start with having you tell us your name, your position, and a little bit about your background and what you do. And I'll call in, in on each of you individually, and we're gonna start with Amy. Amy? Hi, my name is Amy Burhan. I'm a licensed registered dietitian. I had graduated from Gannon University in 1996, where I earned a bachelor's degree in science with a concentration in dietetics. Most of my background have been working with Sodexo at Spring Hill Living Senior Community for about 25 years. And if you're not familiar with Sodexo, it is a company that provides outsourced food, nutrition, and facilities management services. They serve corporate healthcare and education markets in the US, Canada, and Mexico. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Tom? Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom McClure, and I'm the district manager at the Erie County Conservation District. I grew up in Erie County and always had an um, affinity for the outdoors and was active in my uh, scout troop in high school. I went to Penn State and got my bachelor's degree in wood products manufacturing. So I entered the workforce in the hardwood lumber industry and um, worked there for about 13 years. 
And um, I was away at that time. I moved back to Erie County and worked in the uh, fruit and wine industry uh, in the agricultural sector of Erie County. And now um, I'm working in management uh, uh, for the conservation district. Uh, my main job duty is to manage people and to manage the district's finances. I answer to a board of directors and I oversee all of our conservation programs uh, that we administer uh, there at the conservation district. Glad to be here, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Dan. Hi, my name is Dan Przbrowski. Uh, I'm a registered nurse. I'm currently the director of nursing at Lee Comet Village Square. Uh, I earned my nursing degree at Clarion University. Um, I started out uh, in uh, intensive care unit uh, in uh, Titusville, Titusville Area Hospital. Um, I went from there to uh, corrections, worked 23 years uh, in corrections, uh, started as a staff nurse. Uh, then I was promoted to uh, healthcare administrator. And finally, before I retired with the state, I was a deputy superintendent at uh, Cambridge Springs Prison. Uh, after retiring, uh, I got back into the nursing field because uh, it's very rewarding for me uh, working in uh, long-term care. And like I said, currently I'm the director of nursing at Lee Comet Village Square, and I love it. Thanks, Thank Dan. You. Yep, Rachel. Hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Ponser. I'm a certified respiratory therapist at UPMC Hammett. Um, I got my respiratory degree last year in the height of the pandemic with Mercer's University. Um, and I give treatments and I'm assisting with CPR, administering oxygen, um, educating patients and families. And I, I love everything that I do. Thanks, Rachel. Janet. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Janet Anderson, and I have worked in quasi-governmental positions, primarily in economic and workforce development, as well as in the government itself. I graduated from Penn State University with a Bachelor of Science degree in accounting and have concluded some master's coursework, um, as well as received several certifications um, in industry recognized areas. Um, I've been fortunate enough to run for state office and work for both former Governor Tom Ridge and Senator Jane Earle. Currently, I am reevaluating my own career goals and, in, and am exploring options, um, including self-employment. Thanks, Jan. So we're going to start with you first. Um, and what we want you to do is, is give us your experience uh, based on regional data and your own experience. Could you please share your insights on employment opportunities, employer needs, and skills that employers are really interested in? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, so as you students will learn throughout the evening, many of us adults have not stayed or participated in positions that have matched our own studies. A career is a journey and includes continuous learning in order to move up a career ladder. Um, I'm gonna talk about three areas that you can work on right now while you're still in school to help make that journey easier for you. So first, it's important for you to do your research. Um, so we're gonna focus on on that for a couple of minutes here. Um, there is data that can help you see what's available in the way of occupations right here in Erie County. The Pennsylvania Career Link provides labor market information um, that you can find on the web by going to the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry website or to the local workforce development board website, um, or just visiting the Pennsylvania career link in person or calling in. The data that you wanna ask for is called the high priority occupation list or the in-demand occupation list. 
Both lists will show you open positions locally or in Pennsylvania, respectively. The entry level wage and salary or the wage and salary for that occupation with experience. It will also show you the required training to get into that type of occupation. You can then go to another source called ONET and ONET will provide you specific information about the career that you will find very helpful, um, as well as sources that you have available right there in your school district. This is a very broad industry, um, as you heard earlier. You may find that you're interested in something specific to healthcare, like nursing, medical records specialist, contact tracing, therapy, therapist, dentist, hygienist, veterinarian, or maybe something in those areas that are more um, attuned to taking care of the patient that are not medical, like meal preparation, maintenance in the hospital, or a care facility. Or maybe you're more interested in engineering, like chemical engineering or industrial engineering, or driving a truck. There are opportunities for industrial or heavy truck drivers, as well as more local box um, truck drivers. And we are fortunate in our area to have several food manufacturers like JBM or one of our local wineries where you might be able to find an opening uh, and a career path for you. A lab technician is also another area and that doesn't necessarily mean a lab in a hospital. It might be a lab in an industrial facility or at a local winery or perhaps in farming. Farming is another area where you may find the opportunity that you're looking for. Perhaps landscape or groundskeeper. Those of you that like golf might want to become a groundskeeper someday. And I could go on. There are so many possibilities that are located right here in Northwest Pennsylvania. The opportunities pay anywhere from mid 20,000s a year to beyond, well beyond 100,000, depending on your education and experience. This is an industry where employers are willing to help defray the cost of training and education for you, for the right work ethic. Um, and we're going to talk a little more about that in just a minute. But like so many others, you may not even know what career to look at. So let's start with the fact that you are going to spend 25% of your adult life working. So it's important to think about what it is that you really like to do. And I know that's a hard question to ask yourself. You are in the perfect place right now to try things. School offers many opportunities for you, including Career Street. Take advantage of those opportunities. We're fortunate to have Jen Ponser and Career Street in our backyard. They offer you many chances to see what a career might provide for you in a particular area. There are also opportunities to participate in activities. Things like sports and clubs, your church, out of school activities like um, Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, I heard someone talk about that, and many others. You'll learn teamwork, leadership, the ability to work with diverse people. Um, there are so many opportunities within activities that will benefit you that you may not even realize you're learning or consider take a, taking a part-time job or volunteering. Many of the hospitals and nursing um, facilities might offer the, the ability to volunteer, to check the industry out and see if it's right for you. It also, working with Career Street, you might be able to do that virtually or um, in person, depending on the timing. 
The other place that you should consider going is to your mentors. It's really important to talk to people um, that know you about what it is, what your strengths are. Most of you will go to and talk to your parents, or maybe your parents will talk to you about what they think you should do. And they're a, while they are a great source, it's also important for you to ask your mentors outside your family, as they may see your strengths in a more objective way. Individuals like your coach or a guidance counselor or a boss at a part-time job, your teachers, your pastor, your friends, parents might be able to provide you some guidance or your neighbors. They can help you help guide you to the type of occupation that will make you happy and produce success. Remember, you're going to spend 25% of your time there. And don't be afraid to explore. This is the time to do that. Take a part-time job or volunteer just to see if you like the work. So what is it that employers are looking for? Well, first and foremost, employers are looking for basic skills. So while you may not really care for your math class right now, do your best because those skills will matter no matter what career you go into. Or verbal skills like reading and writing, communication. It's important to set aside your cell phone and be able to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, you may have to do that over a system like we're using tonight, and you need to be able to talk to a screen. Digital literacy has become a big deal in the last couple of years. Something that was not so critical um, ha has become really critical today. So learn as much as you can about using and communicating with technology. Take full advantage of your schooling right now. Do your best, even when you don't like that math class or reading class. Do the best that you can. Learn as much as you can because it will benefit you in the long run. Participate if given the opportunity in internships or co-ops. That will help force you out of your comfort zone and you will learn more about yourself when you're forced out of your comfort zone than when you stay within your comfort zone. Again, I'm gonna say take full advantage of Career Street. It's something that you have access to while you're in school. It provides you the opportunity to meet with employers in person and virtually. It provides you the opportunity to listen to individuals who are in the position that you think you might want to be in, sometimes via video, and then you can ask them questions after. It will give you the opportunity to take tours um, and in-person or virtual. So there's a lot of benefit to Career Street. Um, and the more you know about a career, the more likely you are to like it when you land that position. So what skills do employers need? Employers are really looking for individuals with the right attitude and work ethic. It's important to understand that right now they are um, doing a lot of training um, on their own. And while some jobs do require education and training before you come into the position, um, some, some don't, and you could start at a lower level and they may become your partner, they being your employer, to help you complete the training that you need. Initiative is really critical. Someone that's willing to learn and try new things um, will be heads and shoulders above someone that's unwilling. A creative thinker, and again, if you're in a, on a sports team or participating in clubs, it's something you'll learn. Leadership, work ethic, being honest. Um, if you make a mistake, uh, you know, admitting that mistake uh, really matters. As someone with integrity, 
someone that's a risk taker, um, not afraid to try new things, will uh, go further. Someone with digital literacy capabilities, um, they are looking for people with financial literacy and a work-life balance. So those are things while you're in high school that you can work on uh, right now and take advantage of the um, opportunity that's before you. Um, I think I'll stop there, Mary, um, and wait for the last question. Thank you. That was really good and really comprehensive. Thanks for that. Um, we did get one question that came in anonymously through the chat asking where they can find the data. They've been on ONET. That didn't work. I directed them to nwpajobconnect.org under the resources tab to look for the high priority occupations list. That's right, correct? Yes. Okay, very so, good. So ONET, I guess, let me ask a question. ONET didn't work because they didn't like the information or they They couldn't... wanted more regional data rather than more nationwide data. So that's- So, so um, let me just add, you can put in the location in ONET. So go a little deeper. Um, you can get information for Erie County. And we actually have attendees from Warren County on the call today, too. And you can do that for any county, yes, correct? Correct. Very you good. Thank you, Janet. In. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to turn to some of the other panelists. And Amy, I'm going to start with you first. Okay. okay so first question for you is, you are a clinical dietitian. What does a dietitian do and what interested you in that career? Sure. Uh, clinical dietitians monitor and assess the nutrition of patients to assist with recovery or treatment of their medical condition. Common job duties include nutrition assessments, learning about the patient's eating habits and lifestyle, providing nutrition education, and helping them develop goals and plans. A clinical dietitian also maintains medical records and documents patient progress. And what really interests me in this career um, was early on, um, when I was in my early 20s, I took a personal interest in my own health. I had noticed in my freshman year of college that I wasn't eating right. And because of that, I had gained some unwanted weight and just had no idea how to eat healthy. At that point, um, I knew that I was interested in the medical field, but wasn't really sure what direction I wanted to go into. And that was a great time for me to take a basic nutrition class. And I immediately felt a true connection and a desire to learn more. I started practicing what I learned and I had my own success. Realizing the impact nutrition had on my life, I knew that I wanted to help others. Okay. so. Amy, what level of education is required to become a dietitian? And are there subjects in high school that are important that students could study to prepare them for that kind of job? Or are there other things students can do to prepare themselves while they're still in high school? Sure. Well, um, to become a dietitian, there are really three steps. The first is to find a college or university that offers a specific set of courses outlined by the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. This program was most recently com completed at an undergraduate level. However, starting in 2024, a graduate degree will be required to sit for the registered dietetics exam. Mm -hmm. Second is to complete the required internship which is 1,200 hours of supervised practice under a licensed professional. And then third is to take and pass the registered dietetics exam. What students can do now is a, you know, students should have an interest in health and science classes, especially biology, chemistry, anatomy and physiology, and also just basic skills in math and communication can be very helpful. And other things they can do, if there's an interest in nutrition, they can reach out to their local dietitians, set up interviews on the phone, or even shadow them in their practice. And that can really help identify if future in dietetics is for them. So Amy, what is that exam like? 
Well, you know, um, I can remember, um, you know, our teachers talking about it. And what we would do with students as soon as we graduated, we actually had purchased a book this thick to help us prepare. And I also took a course to also prepare myself for that exam. And so the more preparation, the better. Okay, and how long does the exam take roughly? I mean, from when you took it, how long was it then? So, you know, that was like 25 years ago. <laughs> um, I, you know what, I wanna say it was like maybe, I'm gonna guess about three or four hours. Okay, gotcha. Um, third question for you, what kinds of places employ dietitians and can you help us understand what the earning potential could be in that career? Sure. So clinical dietitians are found in many settings, including hospitals, nursing home, outpatient clinics, community programs such as WIC that are found in doctor offices, schools and universities, military bases, and some dietitians even have their own private practice. And really potential earnings vary quite a bit state by state. I was really surprised as I researched this recently for Career Street, just how different each state can be. Um, in Pennsylvania, salaries range from 35,000 and may go up to 79,000 with a median of 56.7,000. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Jen, did you see any, any questions in the chat for Amy? No, we don't have any questions right now, Mary. Okay, thank you. Amy, thanks a lot, really appreciate thank you. that. Yes. Um, okay, so now we're gonna turn to Rachel. Rachel, you're up. Uh, first question for you. You are a certified respiratory therapist and we would like to know what does a respiratory therapist do and what level of education is required? And then what did you do to need to become certified? Thank you. Um, yes, I'm a certified respiratory therapist. Um, what I do basically is I give breathing treatments such as nebulizers, which is some kids get them, some adults get them. It's a misted medication that you inhale. Most commonly people will use an inhaler, which kind of looks like the L that you put in your mouth or kids will use them with spacers. Um, I assist in cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR. Um, I administer oxygen and I maintain a safe and patent airway in emergencies or planned procedures such as um, undergoing bronchoscopies, which is taking pictures from inside the lungs, <clears throat> excuse me, and also um, certain uh, heart imaging procedures. I also educate patients and families on airway diseases such as asthma, pneumonia, um, congestive heart failure, and stuff like that. I also, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a respiratory therapist, I don't personally, but a respiratory therapist can also do um, sleep studies and diagnose whether a patient has sleep apnea in which you might need a CPAP or a BiPAP machine, which is um, bi-level positive airway pressure, which can help inflate the lungs and make sure that your blood that is circulating through your body as you sleep doesn't become acidic, causing different kinds of malfunctions in the brain and in the body and overall just not good things. Um, I have an associate's degree in respiratory therapy that I got from Mercier University in 2020. Um, some of my coworkers do have bachelor's degrees, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't separate us. It, it can take two years or it can take four years. Whichever school you really go to is the degree you're going to get. Um, uh, to become certified means to have graduated with a degree in respiratory therapy and to pass the therapist multiple, excuse me, multiple choice exam or the TMC exam, which is a four hour test that you can either take in person or online that usually takes about eight months to prepare for. Okay, gotcha. Um, so you got your degree fairly recently, right? So yes. my second question for you was, how long have you been in your job? Um, so it's been, what, about a year, or a little over a year? Yeah, October 26th was my one year. Okay, gotcha. So what's been the most challenging part of your job, and what do you like most about it? 
So not to be obvious, but I think the, the hardest part of my job has been COVID-19 um, with it being a respiratory virus that has kind of, that has literally taken our world down. Um, I see these, pe- these patients every day. I saw them today um, and kind of not being able to really ask somebody, hey, I'm new at this, what am I supposed to do? And then they, instead of giving me the answers, they say, I don't know, let's do it together. And we kind of are learning as we're going. And that's been the most difficult thing because I'm so used to asking a question and getting an answer and just basically going from there. And so um, everybody is kind of asking, what do we do? And then everyone's answering, I don't know. (laughs) So that's been the hardest challenge, I think. But as the year has gone on, um, we're all slowly learning what we need to do and um, kind of snowballing from there. Uh, you had asked another question, I'm sorry. Yep. What, what do you like most about it? I like most about my job is the emergencies. If you would have asked me that like before, I would have definitely said, oh, I like going and seeing people, but I like being the relief that the patients have, whether they were unconscious and they become conscious because now they can breathe. Um, and seeing them light up when they're in distress and I give them a treatment and they feel better or I give them a kind of therapy or um, percussion to kind of loosen up whatever's going on inside of their lungs and to just kind of help be their safe, being being their their safety net, like someone who can help them breathe because you don't realize how scary it is until you can't do it. And everyone, is everyone who I see almost always walks away and they're like, thank you so much. I feel so much better. And that's, I think the most, this, I th- that's the best part of my job. That's, that's great. So we have a question in the chat for you, Rachel. Um, okay. So when did you start becoming interested in respiratory therapy and what did your path look like? Well, I did not start in respiratory therapy. I actually started with a degree in, I don't, I don't have a business degree, but I started in business at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Was not for me, not saying it's not for everybody, but it was not for me. And so I came home, took a year off and my mom actually was like, there's a rising need for this job called a respiratory therapist. Would you be interested in it? And I was like, sure. And so it's kind of gone on from there. My dad is a nurse at Hammett and I knew I wanted to be somewhat in the service like of helping people and doing that, but I didn't really want to be a nurse. And this is kind of like a nice little in between being a nurse and being a service provider and helping people feel better without, without becoming a nurse. And I haven't looked back since. That's great. Thank you. So what qualities do you think are important for people to have to be most successful as a respiratory therapist? I think definitely being open-minded and being brave. It is scary what we've been doing. And I didn't realize how involved it was when I was a student until you're practicing on the dummies and stuff like that. And then suddenly it's an actual person in front of you and you don't, um, you don't realize how big it is until it's right there in front of you. And even though all the fear is going on up here, you're doing it with your hands and you're helping save this person's life. And um, it's definitely, um, it's definitely hard, but it's, it's easy to overcome. Cause when I first started, I wasn't ready. Like I did not feel prepared or anything like that. And then now a year later, I can do whatever I want. I can do it in front of me and I can help take care of patients with the nurses and the doctors and have confidence. So it does take a brave heart and it does take an open mind and um, people respond differently to different kinds of medications and to different kinds of orders. So you definitely have to be open-minded and you have to also be able to be willing to take criticism because you're not always going to be right. But when it comes to someone else's life, you have to be willing to accept that. 
Also, being a team player, we are the few but the, the few but the mighty, and we got to work together. Um, and I think that's um, that's another big key in it. Gotcha. Thank you, Rachel. Talk about baptism by fire. You become a respiratory therapist in the middle of a pandemic that's a respiratory illness based thing. So thank you for all of that advice and, and all of that um, inspiration. Um, so now I'm going to turn to you, Tom. First question for you is what is the Erie County Conservation District and what are some of its most important responsibilities? Well, that's a great question because I receive that question a lot because there's a lot of people out there that aren't familiar with, with what we are and, and who we are and what we do. Um, but a conservation district, our conservation district, our main focus is on erosion and soil loss and um, trying to keep uh, water quality um, at a good level locally. Um, in Pennsylvania, there's 66 conservation districts. So every county, uh, except for Philadelphia County, has a conservation district. And so um, the Erie County Conservation District is in the borders of, of our county. Um, some of the work that we do, uh, we work on sometimes on behalf of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. And so we review environmental permits and um, approve those permits. Uh, they come through our office for construction projects. And if there's really any earth moving going on in, in Erie County, uh, usually we know about it. And there's control measures in place that uh, um, contractors and construction sites should abide by uh, to keep that soil on site instead of in our waterways. And so we also work with our local farmers who raise uh, livestock um, and raise corn, soybeans, things like that. Um, we advise them and offer technical assistance uh, to our farming community uh, to do what we call best management practices, which um, reduces the amount of uh, pollution and soil pollution in our local waterways and also to keep the, the manure that's produced on the farm, uh, to keep it on the farm and, and out of the streams. Um, some of the other things we do, we have a, a environmental education program. And so we have uh, an educator on staff uh, that either goes out to our local schools, our school districts, or we bring the, the school districts to our uh, facilities um, in Mill Creek Township. We're up on Wager Road and um, where we have a park called Headwaters Park. We manage that a 70 acre uh, public facility uh, with hiking trails and things like that. So we'll bring schools out there and do some environmental education programming uh, for all ages, really, um, preschool, um, and even through uh, collegiate uh, groups come out um, and do some studies um, on our property. So, um, you know, we, we do all those things. Uh, we have a, basically a limited staff. We've got um, eight people working at the conservation district. And so you'll find similar missions um, uh, across the board in, in Pennsylvania and really conservation districts exist um, throughout the world, uh, mostly North America, but mostly in the United States. Thanks, Tom. Well, that's a lot. That is a like a variety of things. Um, for students who might be interested in natural resources and their preservation, uh, what kind of job opportunities exist? And, you know, I'm thinking about everything you just said there what kind of education does someone need to work in a conservation district? Because it sounds like you have to have really varied expertise. I guess I didn't expect that whenever I was thinking about, you know, what, what it is that you do. So a couple questions. For students who are interested in natural resources and their preservation, what kinds of job opportunities exist and what can they do best to prepare for those jobs? Right. Well, good, uh, a good place to start is a conservation district. Like I mentioned, there's 
there's 66 of them. And conservation districts are government agencies in Pennsylvania. And so um, you think about it, some of the staffs are small like ours, maybe eight, nine people. Um, some of the counties like Lancaster and, and York County um, down south in Pennsylvania have um, 20 to 30 people on staff. So um, they range from what they call from uh, agricultural technicians. So they're working um, out on site with the farmers, um, doing inspections, things like that. Um, out in the streams, doing monitoring, um, doing uh, watershed work. Uh, and also, like I mentioned, um, doing inspections and, and permit reviewing uh, for all the construction and development happening in Pennsylvania. Uh, so conservation districts are a good place to start. Um, you know, I mentioned agriculture. Uh, we work a lot with farmers. So that industry itself needs a lot of support. And so a farmer will need their soil tested. And so there's um, uh, farming consultants out there that uh, will have a lab and, and conduct uh, soil testing. Um, and there's also farm planning or what we call conservation planning. And it kind of lays out a farm. Uh, so uh, the grower uh, knows how to rotate his crops or her crops, um, where to pasture their, their livestock and things like that. It's a, it's a guidance document that is prepared for them. Um, we work a lot with, when we talk about conservation projects, they're basically construction projects. Um, they need to be designed by uh, an engineer. And so there is a great need for uh, civil engineers. Um, so we work a lot with our municipalities, our boroughs, our townships and cities in Erie County. And each of those have their own engineer. And each engineering company has its own staff that works on all these projects. So all these construction projects that we're involved with uh, need a good design. So there's always a, a great need for engineers. Um, like I mentioned before, there's environmental education. A lot of these uh, conservation groups and agencies have educators that are out there um, teaching little ones and adults uh, about uh, our natural resources. So, uh, you know, it's, their classroom is the outdoors, uh, not your traditional, um, your, not your traditional classroom. And so um, other uh, positions that might be available uh, for people would be through the, um, the state agencies and departments, like the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, or uh, the Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. And so those, those are the people that operate Presque Isle State Park and all the state parks in Pennsylvania. And so there's foresters, there's park managers. Um, there's a large job corps there at what we call DCNR. Uh, so that's a good place uh, to look as well. Okay, we have a, thank you. We have a question in the chat and um, it says for the environmental conservation uh, that's part of your job, is it part of your job to clear out creeks that have trees that fell over them? Well, that's a good question. Um, if those trees fall um, on public lands, then it's really the responsibility of that municipality or the owner of, of the property to maintain that. And so if that tree falls across the creek in, um, on private property, the owner of the land can maintain that by removing the tree. Now, what we don't like to see is large excavators in the stream digging within, that requires a permit, but simply maintaining uh, the water course by tree removal and things like that, as long as you're not digging in the ground, uh, it's up to the landowner to, to maintain that and clean that up. Okay, thank you. Um, third question for you. Um, are there activities specifically for high school students that they can get engaged in to improve the environment? And if so, what are those? And where can they learn more? 
right? And so you wanna prepare yourself uh, for some of these jobs I mentioned. Um, if you're going the collegiate route, you know, you wanna concentrate on your maths and sciences. Um, great verbal skills are always a plus. But overall, I think a good work ethic and, and determination um, also come in handy. When we talk about activities uh, for high school students, um, check with your, uh, your local, well, your high school science teacher. There's something that we're involved in. It's called the Envirothon, and it's an academic environmental competition. Um, all the counties in Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania have them. And so it involves topics such as forestry, aquatics, soils, wildlife, and each year there's a rotating current issue topic as a wild card. So teams compete locally. If you win your county, you move on to states. And if you move on to states, you participate in an international Envirothon competition. And I would, I'm proud to say that Erie County has won the international competition twice. And so Pennsylvania traditionally does very well. So that's one thing you wanna look at. If your school does not have an Envirothon team, you need to call me, we need to talk to your teachers and get you one. And we can, um, we have staff here at the Conservation District that can help you get that set up. So if that's an interest of yours, give us a call. And if you have questions like, how do I, remove a tree from a creek, you call us on that one too. <laughs> um, you know, other things like our local cleanup days, you wanna keep your eye out for those. And it might be up to you as a high school student to organize, organize a group, participate in what's called the International Coastal Cleanup. Uh, that happens every fall um, in the Lake Erie watershed. So there's lots of uh, opportunities between that, uh, Keep America Beautiful type programs or cleanups. Um, they're great volunteer or uh, opportunities. So you always want to keep your eye out for that. And if you want to know, hey, when's the next event? Uh, again, give us a call uh, at the Conservation District. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, do our best to lead you in the right direction. Hey, Tom, is your number 814-825-6403? That's correct. Okay, um, great. Now, if, if uh, for the people who are watching from Warren County today, if they look up Warren County Conservation District, will they be able to find that phone number? Absolutely. Okay, okay. Yeah, they're, they're located, um, I believe, on Conowango Avenue in North, in, uh, North Warren. Okay. 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 Very good. Thank you. Um, okay, Dan, I'm going to move on to you. Um, first question for you. You are a nurse at LECOM Senior Living. And what kind of education did you pursue to become qualified for your job? Well, I, I mean, obviously, you have to go to, you know, nursing school to become a registered nurse. Uh, prior to me going to Clarion University, though, uh, I did go, I was in uh, the U.S. Air Force uh, as a medical service specialist, uh, basically to get uh, some medical training and background to try to see if this was truly a career path that, uh, you know, that I wish to, you know, to follow. And it turns out that this was exactly the career path that, uh, you know, that I liked and I enjoyed. And uh, it actually made going to you know, nursing school kind of a, a lot easier because I had uh, all that background you know, prior to you know, actually going to nursing school. Uh, you want to have a good background in math uh, because a lot of times you have drug calculations and stuff that you have to do. So you, know, you should be studying you know, math, your sciences. Um, you know, anatomy, physiology, those are all good, you know, subjects to have, you know, some knowledge before you go to, to nursing school. Um, you know, people can try out different, uh, you know, medical careers as well to see if, you know, that that's really the career path that they want to follow. Um, but unfortunately, if, you know, it's not for everybody. And sometimes people get into the profession and, you know, and find out that, yeah, this isn't, really, you know, what I want to do, uh, but it's been very, very rewarding for me, 
And like I said, um, you know, having that um, Air Force background in medical and having a good, uh, you know, basis in math, science, and, uh, you know, chemistry really helped out uh, in nursing school. So Dan, thank, first of all, thank you for your service. Um, it related to that. So be, you were in the service and you did medical kinds of things prior to going to nursing school. Like, how did you get ready for that? What did you have to do in the service to prepare to do what it was that you did? Well, um, actually the service kind of prepared all of us for, uh, you know what I mean, for that. It basically, uh, you learned the, uh, you know, the medical profession, uh, you know, eight, nine hours a day, you know, five, you know, five days a week. Um, so I was in, you know, like, uh, you know, my, my clinical studies for uh, 16 weeks. So for a full 16 weeks, um, I did nothing but learn, you know, uh, healthcare, nursing, uh, you know, medical technology, um, all that, all that kind of stuff. And then after that, uh, I did a two month uh, clinical rotation at Travis Air Force Base in San Francisco, uh, which has a huge base hospital uh, and just this tons of uh, good experience uh, with things that were going on at, you know, at that time. Of course, that was back in the late 80s and early 90s. I'm kind of dating myself right now. Uh, but wonderful, wonderful experiences that really prepared me well for, uh, it was an easy, easy decision uh, that when I got out of the Air Force that I was going to uh, nursing school. And I did right out of, you know, right out of the Air Force. That, that's, that's what I did. And, uh, you know, started the ground running. Gotcha. Thank you. So question from the audience, what is the most challenging part of your job? Uh, right now, probably the most challenging part is, is staffing to make sure that, uh, you know, that uh, our residents or, or patients are well taken care of, um, which is good for our audience because there's a lot of healthcare field, you know, positions available out there. Uh, you know what I mean? So uh, if this is truly your passion, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to, uh, you know, to really consider, you know, consider the field. Uh, there are so many opportunities. Um, nursing has really been, um, you know, has, has really benefited me you know, throughout my, you know, throughout my career. It's been very rewarding. It's been, you know, very, you know, financially rewarding. Um, so, uh, you know what I mean? Anybody that it, it really cares about people, that wants to help people, that wants to make a difference in somebody's life, uh, this is truly the profession, you know, to be in. There's no other profession out there that, you know, that you are rewarded day in and day out, uh, you know what I mean, by the, the, the things that you do. Um, you know, that's in itself, I mean, you know, of course I get paid for what I do, but, you know, sometimes I almost feel guilty because I, you know, I, I get more reward from, you know, uh, you know, the residents just being, you know, happy with, uh, you know, me spending time with them and talking with them and, you know, making sure that, you know, that they have a good day and, you know, we're doing everything that we can do to make sure that, you know, they are being treated the way uh, you know, that they should be treated, uh, you know, with respect and dignity. Uh, a lot of times, you know, some of our residents, uh, you know, they don't have anybody else. We have some residents that are, you know, 100 plus years old and, you know, they've kind of outlived their family. So we are the only family that they have. So, you know, making them feel good and, and you know, thanking them for just, you know, their life uh, you know what I mean? And all the experience and stuff that they've had, you know, and they love sharing that, you know, so like I said, just very, very rewarding. So I think what you just said sort of was a nice segue into our next question for you. And that is what's the difference between being a nurse in a hospital or a doctor's office setting and being a nurse in a senior living kind of setting? Okay. Uh, it, really, there's a there's uh, major differences between you know between all of them. I'm going to start with you know doctor's office. Doctor's office, uh, you know, I mean, for the most part, uh, you're talking about well visits. You're talking about people that you know may, mainly in good health, and it's kind of you know maintenance visits, uh, you know, medication, uh, you know, reorders or adjustments, you know, that kind of stuff. 
Um, and then you get to the hospital, you get more uh, uh, acute type, uh, you know, illnesses. You have people that could be really sick. You have people that could be critically ill, you know, that require intensive care. Uh, so that that's the type of, um, you know, patients that you have in a hospital. Uh, you really don't spend a lot of time with every, you know, every patient because, you know, they may be in, some may be in for a few days, some may be in for a few weeks, uh, but, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're going to move on uh, and there's going to be new people. Uh, when you're, uh, you know, when you're working in like senior living, uh, you know, you really have, they're, they're, they're family. Uh, so, you know, you're with them for, you know, for many, many years. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's different that, um, you know, you still have to deal with, uh, sometimes they get acutely ill, you know, and sometimes it's just, uh, you know, maintenance or, or, or well visits. Uh, and a lot of times it's just, it's more like a family unit, uh, you know, in a, in a senior living center, that's their home. So, you know, when we respect that, uh, before we go into a room, you know, we'll ask for permission to come in because again, it's their, you know, it's their home and that's how they're treated there. So that's the differences between uh, long-term care hospital and uh, like a doctor's office. Thank you. <clears throat> um, that's great perspective. One last question for you before I open up with a final question for the group. So um, you've worked in a lot of different settings, right, as a nurse, um, but can you help us understand the earning potential in nursing? Uh, I mean, the sky's the limit. Uh, you know, a, a, reg a grad registered nurse, you know, uh, can probably expect to make, you know, between you know, 55 and, you know, $60,000 a year, uh, you know, with experience, depending on which area that you, you know, that you get into, um, you know, I mean, starting salaries can be range from, you know, in the 70s to 90,000, you know, dollars, you get into, you know, management positions or administrative, you know, positions, and you're talking, you know what I mean, plus 100,000, you know what I mean, uh, you know, per year. So, uh, it is, as far as you want to go, as far as you want to take it, uh, you know, I mean, the earning potential really is out there, you know, what I mean, for, uh, you know, for students. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Dan. All right. So, Jen, I think I've actually covered all the questions in the chat and in the Q&A. So I have one question for all of you, and I'm going to call on you again, um, but the, here it is. This is the last question for all of you. If you could leave students with one last piece of advice about pursuing opportunities in the science and health career pathway, what would that be? And Tom, I'm going to start with you on this one. Sure. I think uh, you want to have perseverance. Um, if it's something that you really want and you want to go after, then stick with it. Um, and also, uh, Janet mentioned this er earlier that um, you know your career path may not be straight and narrow. It may zigzag all over the place. Um, so stay open-minded uh, for good opportunities, and um, you know take the blinders off and and uh, allow yourself to um explore those opportunities great thank you rachel how about you i would definitely say to basically the same thing as what tom said to not give up and if this is definitely something that you plan on pursuing to stick with it even when it gets hard because trust me it gets hard and you want to stop and you want to turn around and you want to pick something else. But if your heart's in it and your mind's in it, you have to keep going. It, it won't always be easy. And even when you get there, it'll still be hard. But knowing that you're making a difference and that you're changing people's lives and even saving people's lives, that's the reward that you can take with you wherever you go. Thank you. Dan, how about you? Okay, I, I think the one thing, uh, and, and maybe it's more of a trait uh, that, you know, that I, I would give, uh, you know, advice to people wanting to get into, you know, nursing is to have compassion. 
um, you know, you really have to, you know, have compassion working in this, uh, you know, career path. Uh, but the, the people that uh, are compassionate and provide compassionate care uh, are the ones that really excel in the field. Thanks, Dan. Amy, how about you? Sure. I would say just do what you're doing right now, learning about all sorts of different fields. There are so many opportunities and just positions and professions that are available that I'm even learning about that are new and really um, just so many opportunities for, for students. Great. Thanks, Amy. And Janet, how about you? So I'm going to say the similar to Amy, um, and I'm borrowing this from an earlier session, eat off the buffet. Um, you know, you guys are deciding today what you're going to do for the rest of your life, and it's going to zig and it's going to zag, and it's going to go all over the place. So take the time right now to explore as many opportunities as you can so that when it does take that turn, you're prepared. Okay, very good, thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, with that, we're ready to wrap up the event. Um, speakers, we really appreciate you being here tonight. Uh, thank you for sticking with us when we had the Zoom issues, honestly. That was not us. I don't know what happened there, but I'm glad you're all in. I'm glad that you were able to participate and we're very grateful to you. Um, and for those of you who watched us online, thank you for that. I hope you found it very valuable and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye everyone.